I, I think based on the uh, stated testimony of of the defendant, uh, Craig Ramon, who was the only eyewitness, and based upon the pattern of injuries that are present here, um, what I believe happened is that he was struck from the left side and that uh, forced him into the ground. It's, it's also been the testimony here that uh, Ms. Paltrow was on top of him at some point, so the combined weight of the two individuals slamming into the ground caused the fracture and the head injury. And I don't think it would be plausible that if he were running into her that he would have broken the ribs on the side of his chest. He likely would have had his arms extended, he would have protected himself, he would have had knees, arms, etc. in front of his chest. And so um, he might have had other injuries, could have broken a leg or an arm or a wrist or something like that. But, but in terms of a frontal collision, had he uh, run into Ms. Paltrow, I don't think he would have had these types of injuries. Dr. Gibby, you can certainly take the stand and be ready. Carrie, did you let the jury know that we're ready? Carrie, did you let the jury know that we're ready? We are. You may be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. Let the record reflect. Uh, parties are present, counsel is present, and uh, the jury is all present. Thank you. Dr. Gibby, you're still under oath. Mr. Egan. that he doesn't have other things in his brain that would be causing comorbidities, the, you know, the, the challenges that he's having with his current neurology function. In your opinion, what effect did the ski collision and what happened to him there um, uh, have to do with his uh, stress and anxiety? Well, I think two things happened to him. I think one, that, uh, and we've already talked a little bit about it, this was a man who was talkative, boisterous, a little over the top at times, and, and that pattern, because of his frontal lobe injury, accelerated to the point where after 15 minutes, it's hard to have a conversation with him because he's repetitive and goes around in circles and he's very bright and uh, very intellectual if you're discussing some intellectual matter, but when you're discussing his state of affairs, his personal life, he, he obsesses about it. And the second thing I think that's happened to him is his mind, meaning the way he comes to think about what's happening to him in his life. And, and some of that may be from brain injury, some of that's just his lifetime personality style, but he has become obsessed with trying to return himself to the level of functioning he perceived he had before this accident. And I, I make no judgment. What? Now say that again. His, the assessment, his assessment of, of the life he had before. He's obsessed with getting back to that. He's obsessed with getting back to that. He, uh, he and I had a discussion that, uh, that not every problem he encountered in everyday life when he couldn't remember where he put his keys, not every problem was a consequence of the injury suffered in this accident. Some of that was just normal aging. For me, the primary consequence was his emotional and behavioral regulation and then the impact it had on his mind, his perception of who he is and who he was. From his view, he is not the person he was. From his view, he has lost 
Terry Sanderson. And this is what he said to me at one point uh, when I interviewed him. Would that be sure? Okay. You may. So looking at 43P, um, I mean, it's a demonstrative exhibit, so